For those of us at WCF who've had the opportunity to work with John Bercia, our hearts are broken by his recent passing. Our thoughts are with his family. His loss will be felt far beyond the borders of our community. His work spread cultural understanding, and his passion to identify and eliminate human trafficking around the world was relentless. As a Pulitzer Prize winning journalist, he was a shiny example of what the Fourth Estate can be. It's with heavy hearts and yet great pride that we present this special edition of Global Perspectives. Global Perspectives with Pulitzer Prize winning commentator John Bercia. As an interviewer, John Bercia kept the audience on their toes through in depth conversation and by revealing unique experts. This was the case when Jeffrey Baxter, the founding member of Steely Dan, discussed his passion for cybersecurity. Tell us about that defending the, the country piece. You, you always had a natural inclination toward technology. And Most you, guitar players are diode heads. If it lights up, yeah, I gotta have one and plug it into something else. So how did that translate into a connection to f national security, military, uh, well, I, I was working for a number of companies, Fender, Akai, Roland, uh, and at the, that time was the beginning of the digital revolution, if I guess you'd call it, where uh, analog was, was giving way to the new digital uh, formats, uh, both in video and audio and in music reproduction. So to me, the best source for the new technologies was reading defense magazines, Jane's and uh, Defense Weekly, and, and just any publication that came out of the government and military, because it was, there was always something in there about cutting edge technology. So I guess it just caught it all built up in back of the dam, and my dad always said, if you have a good idea, you write it down. So as I said in the, uh, on the, the NBC thing, I sat down to my Tandy 200, <laughs> which dates me, uh, and wrote a paper on uh, converting the Aegis uh, air defense system for the Navy to do theater missile defense, and gave it to a congressman, buddy of mine, who gave it to the vice chairman of the Armed Services Committee, who said, what is this guy from Raytheon or Boeing? No, he's a guitar player for the Doobie Brothers. So next thing I knew, I said, would you accept a position as a, on a civilian advisory board for the Armed Services Committee on Missile Defense. I said, yeah, I guess so. <laughs> I had no idea what it really entailed. Strapped to the chair, yes, uh, yeah, well, me and Joe Walsh and all the things that we did, and you got to confess. You know, it's kind of like, uh, I guess it's own theology. And next thing I knew, I was at Lawrence Livermore uh, working on Star Wars, and I was at the Missile Defense Agency, or SDIO, at the time working for uh, General Mal O'Neill and then later uh, General Lyles and Ron Kadish and, and Trey Obring. And that opened doors to a whole bunch of other things where I'm, a, I'm probably a little nuts. Uh, so the way that I approached problem solving was a little different than I guess many of the folks that I was working with and found myself uh, in some very interesting areas. Cybersecurity was a popular topic on Global Perspectives, as was social rights. In interviews with influential figures like Julian Bond, who worked closely with Martin Luther King Jr. and even wrote his I Have a Dream speech, and others like Naomi Tutu, the daughter of Desmond Tutu, John Bercia's discussions promoted optimism for the future and both cultural and human understanding. You, you've studied international affairs, you've studied divinity, you've studied psychology, you've studied so many things. Too many things. What is it in the human being that leads some to think it's entirely okay to subjugate other people? And we've been dealing with this since the beginning of organized society and we're dealing mm -hmm. with it today. Mm -hmm. is, is there something fundamentally wrong in certain people or is it taught behavior, learned behavior? See, uh, that is one thing that I also came away with from the TRC is that, you know, it was initially, it was very easy for us to point at the individual perpetrators and say what terrible people they must be. But in the process, we also heard their stories. 
we heard about them being parents and spouses and neighbors and members of their church and and all around good people except for this dark part of their lives where they served as as torturers as murderers um, and and so that for me made it clear that it is not about some individual who is born evil um, in most cases it is the opportunity that we give people for either their dark or their light side to to dominate and I think that as communities and countries that we can come up with ways that that ensure that we don't put people in positions where they have absolute control and power over other people. Naomi Tutu was one of many influential descendants to be interviewed by John Bercia. Others include Arun Gandhi, the grandson of Mahatma Gandhi, Ndaba Mandela, the grandson of Nelson Mandela, and Donisha Prendergast, the granddaughter of Bob Marley, and even Sergei Khrushchev, the son of former Soviet Premier Nikita Khrushchev. John Bercia's respectful nature helped all of the guests feel comfortable, including fellow civility expert Ambassador Harriet Elam Thomas. We have had turbulent periods in our nation's history. I'm sure we will have turbulent periods in the future. We're going through one of them today. And civility seems to be forgotten in most conversations. Something as simple as driving down the street can often result in a, in a complicated if, mess if there's an argument, if somebody questions a turn or whatever, and before you know it, there are people are shouting, sometimes people are shot. Mm. Uh, and, and this, I think, is shocking to many who, who witness these developments, especially in other countries, and then they wonder what's going on in America. But the incivility that we're experiencing, I believe, because I look worldwide and I see a lot of it everywhere, it's not the world that we grew up in and in which civility had its place. Upon reflection, I would say that the economic situation worldwide, the political situation worldwide, puts incredible stress on relationships. And while we know that relationships are important in every culture, in every society, and they must be based on trust, but if you're already threatened in terms of your livelihood, in terms of raising your family, uh, how are you going to be able to educate them, and you're feeling that you're not having a fair chance to do that, children enter universities, even state institutions around the country, and leave with horrendous college debt, tuition debt. So those stresses add to the absence, I think, of being polite. Regardless of the topic matter, John Bercia was prepared to hold his own during a conversation, and often offered historical context as well as refreshing perspectives. In his discussion with Ambassador Gary Grappo, they examined what could be the role of the United States internationally. Well, let's see if we can make it more difficult for you by asking you to really focus on what you think the U.S. role should be, including China, but, but looking globally. Um, historically, we've had specific interests in various countries and regions, but generally speaking, my perception is when we've, since World War II, when we've reached out to try to build this international order, we're looking for three things. We're looking for peace and security and even committing forward-based forces to ensure that that happens. We're looking for the evolution of democracy and, and good governance because those reinforce our, our own interests. And we're looking for prosperity, not because economic development is helpful just to the country in question, but its economic prosperity in turn complements ours. And I think in those three areas, you probably cover, broadly speaking, the, the, the bulk of U.S. interests. But um, is, is that sufficient going forward? Or should we have a new sense, maybe something specifically tailored to uh, you know, X region or country? Well, all those areas that you mentioned are still very, very relevant and are going to remain so well into the future. We will always care about, uh, care about security. We will always care about uh, prosperity and growth. We will always 
care about, and that will move in fits and starts, the, the evolution of countries toward more democratic governance uh, and respect for human rights and the rule of law. Um, but there are other factors that are going to come into play today, uh, 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 certainly have already come into play today and going into the future. The role of technology in society, uh, not that we, should, we want a management, although there may be some cases where we'll have to uh, because of its impacts, for example, on human life or uh, the environment, uh, but um, it's moving at a very rapid uh, pace. It's mostly led, at least in our country, by the private sector, and we don't want to in inhibit in any way that kind of creativity and initiative. Um, but um, we need to pay attention to the ro increasing role of technology in human existence, its impact on us and its impact on the environment where we live. Um, and that's another area where collaboration, this collective approach, can be the most positive for everyone. Uh, and I'm hopeful that we'll start doing that. It's already started, but nevertheless, it's something that requires a lot of attention. The whole question of, um, of cyber warfare, of cyber security, and so forth, will require increasing Inten uh, attention on the part of the United States and the global community. Um, and moving on to an another issue, more of a functional issue, of course, um, the environment uh, globally. Uh, there's no such thing as a national environment. It's pretty much international now. How are we going to approach that in a collective way, which is the only way to do it? Uh, and that will require, again, that we have a functioning and effective rules-based international order in which everyone feels that they have a say and can play a role. The important role an individual could have worldwide was often examined on global perspectives. BBC correspondent and author Kim Gaddis shares how she made an impact reporting about the war in Syria after growing up during the civil war in Lebanon. I'm wondering if the, the Civil War experience prepared you for journalism and that journalists sort of counterintuitively run in the direction of yes. conflicts and chaos yeah. and the rest of us are trying to get away. But um, were you sort of hardened, I guess, to the point where you were better able to deal with those later on because you had had the experience of the Civil War? You know, it's it's possible, but I'll, I'll never know, right? Because I'll never know exactly in which way that war has shaped me. Um, and how would I have turned out differently had I not lived through war? Would I be me? Probably not. Mm -hmm. But which parts of me would be different? I don't know. Um, certainly, I think often about how the war instilled in me this constant uh, battle between fight or flight, right? Um, the constant rush of adrenaline that we are addicted to sometimes as journalists. I do think that some of that comes from my experience living in, in a war where you're constantly in the expectation of what's going to happen next, what's going to happen tomorrow, will we live or will we die? And even after the war ended in Lebanon, there were long periods of instability because the war ended with an invasion by um, Syria. And so it meant that we lived under a Syrian occupation for 15 years after the war ended. So yes, I think that a lot of my survival instinct, a lot of my resilience, a lot of my addiction to adrenaline comes from having grown up in that war. But, you know, um, some of it is, is nature rather than nurture, because my sisters went into very different directions. I have two sisters. One is a uh, biologist and one is um, in, in, in the restaurant business. Mm. So we chose very, very different uh, careers. The Middle East was one of the most discussed topics during the duration of Global Perspectives, as seen with guests such as the governor of Kirkuk, Dr. Najah Maldim Karim, expert on U.S.-Iranian relations, Shireen Hunter, and women's rights activist and columnist for the Saudi Gazette, Samar Fatani. Another prevalent topic was human trafficking. Many experts, including abolitionist Kevin Bales, joined John Bercia to discuss the gravity of modern slavery. So this whole question of determining the slave population, if you will, uh, we've seen numbers that range from 25, 27 million up to 50 million, and you have a lot of discussion as to 
how we arrive at those statistics, which are right, which are wrong, which are conservative, which are, are liberal. Do you have a number? And I know you're actively involved in scientific efforts to measure the extent of slavery. Well, I do have a number, but I have to say it's not my number anymore. It's it's our number. Uh, we, we, you know, the in, last September at the United Nations General Assembly, the ILO, the International Organization for Migration, the Walk Free Foundation, the Rights Lab, my own institution, we all worked together for more than two years to arrive at a single global number and stop having competing numbers. So we brought our statistical teams together. We, we agreed a common methodology. We took that out to academics and scientists and had that undergo peer review. So the good news is these days, we're, we're, we don't have all those numbers and we don't have to worry about is it one or the other because we are all arrived at and agreed upon the idea that there are at this moment 40.3 million people, our best estimate, in slavery at any one moment and then we also, for the first time, were able to introduce the idea of a flow number. That is, how many people would pass through the state of enslavement over, say, the last five-year period. And we put that at just over 89 million people. So we have a stock of 40.3 and a flow of about 89 over a five-year period. Now, that's been very exciting to arrive at that kind of unity. Uh, it was a challenge because uh, the international organizations like the UN don't practice data transparency, which is which is required of all academic scientific approach. I mean, you know, if you're doing cancer research, you you obviously always publish your data because it's very important to share with other researchers. John Bercia not only worked to end slavery, but he also gave a platform to many strong and powerful women, including the youngest female master sommelier, Alpana Singh, former president of Ireland and climate warrior, Mary Robinson and Olympic gold medalist in judo, Kayla Harrison. Growing up, was it a straight shot in terms of the martial arts training? Did you have any obstacles along the way, any adjustments you needed to make? Yeah, well, I mean, you know, it's no secret that I was sexually abused by my first coach, so that was definitely a big obstacle that I had to overcome in order to be successful. But um, again, it's just something that, you know, if you decide that it doesn't define you, it doesn't. and. I was very fortunate to be around people like the Pedros, people like Rhonda, people like my old teammates who sort of picked me back up when I was broken and made me whole again. Talk to us about the immense courage it takes to bring that conversation to, to other people and, and maybe, how, how, without getting into specifics, how, how you accomplished that and were able to get back on track. And, and I think this makes you a natural leader in terms of women's rights uh, generally, I mean, you can talk to these things uh, from experience and also from the perspective of a survivor, someone who thrived afterward. Yeah. You know, it's difficult. I mean, that was the hardest day in my life, the day that I finally said something. And for a long time, I dealt with the guilt and the shame and um, sort of the fear that a lot of victims go through. But again, I can't really... I can't speak highly enough of my new coaches, you know, the Pedros, because not only did they change my life, but they saved my life. And they made it so that I could become a strong, confident young woman and have the courage to speak up and have the courage to stand up and say something. And hopefully, you know, my goal is now to be what the Pedros were to me, to someone else. And the, the person who disrupted your life went to prison. Yep, he and, was serving 10 years in federal prison. Mm -hmm. And um, it, how do you start a conversation with young people, especially if you suspect that they may be having some of these same issues. What, what is the best way to reach them and encourage them to, to talk about it? That's a really good question. And you know, one of the things that I'm doing right now to try and help with that is I'm writing a book with a psychologist from McLean Hospital. Educating the next generation was very important to John Bercia. With his guest, former NFL player Wade Davis, they discussed what it was like for Davis to publicly come out as gay, and his current work with equality education. How can we keep these conversations about critical issues related to society, sexuality, gender, civil rights, human rights, et cetera, et cetera, how can we keep those going and expanding if we have so many of these pieces of dead wood, if you will, that are there with good intentions, yeah. but they're they're holding up the conversation. So I have a couple of roles that I 
abide by, and I mentioned this at my talk earlier today. Um, one is, um, can we all be disinterested in the need to be right? And I think that that's a big one. I, I think our desire to be right really closes us off from learning and growing. Um, the second one is, can we be disinterested in thinking of ourselves as good people? I think this idea of goodness, right, is also a blocker that we, oh, I'm a good person. Actually, no, no, you're not. You're just human. You know, you've done some really amazing things, probably, but you've also probably been a jerk too, right? And as long as you can own the fact that you are flawed, a perfectly flawed human being, then you are not resting in your in your own ideas of goodness or your own personal goodness. And I think that those two are something that really people need need to wrestle with more. You know, um, I was given a talk at uh, Penn State for about 500 of their student athletes. And we were talking about consent and sexual harassment and sexual assault. <clears throat> and I asked the students, like, how many of you had a parent or, or someone in your life talk to you about consent? And out of 500 kids, maybe 50 raised their hand. Blew my mind, right? And then when I went home and I wrestled with the idea, I said, oh, their parents think that these are good kids. And because they're a good kid, they would never assault someone. But when one of the three women are survivors of sexual assault, where are those good good kids at? And, and I think that we are more interested in, in our own ideas of our own goodness than we are in actually to connecting with others and seeing ourselves in their struggle. And I think that we've stopped doing that, right? I think that there's a, that there's a, a lack of empathy in this country. I mean, like just empathy of the heart, you know? And um, you as a teacher, I'm sure that when you push your kids to read, part of that reading is to see that they are connected to something larger than themselves, right? That, um, that when you read about someone who is differently abled or someone who is just different from, from you, if you really interrogate what you're reading, you see that they are you, really. You know, and then when you do that, hopefully it pushes you to say, how can I make this issue personal? And if it becomes personal, then you never stop wanting to change the lives of someone else because you know that uh, a disease is, they spread, you know, and poverty is a disease. You know, all these things, they keep spreading, and, if they, and they will spread to us at some point. Although many of the topics presented on Global Perspectives were very serious in nature, John Bercia's sense of humor was given a chance to shine during his more lighthearted episodes, including an interview with award-winning political cartoonist Dana Summers. So the idea of the mystery of, of laughter, obviously comics are meant to be funny. Political cartoons can be funny, but they can be very, very serious as well. Mm -hmm. So um, how do you manage all of that? How do you ensure that you're dealing with a topic in a way that is sensitive if it's serious, but also potentially funny? And, and that whole mystery of laughter thing. Laughter is such a strange phenomenon because a lot of times if someone else is laughing, you'll start laughing too. You don't even know what it's about, <laughs> but it's funny that the person is laughing. It's, it's totally subjective. Something that I think is hilarious, someone else might look at it and say, I don't get this. What do you, what's so funny? You know, a, f a friend of mine was saying just the other day that he has some people who he hangs out with who tr have tried to watch Seinfeld and just don't get it. They just don't think it's funny, which to me, what's not funny about that show? I think it's all subjective. So, and especially in the comic strips, uh, I do them. I do what I think is funny. I do what would make me laugh if I were reading a comic strip, and then I just put it out there in hope that's, that someone else thinks it's funny. As far as the editorial cartoons go, you're right. There's, you, you take a serious topic. To get a serious point across, sometimes you can use some pretty dark humor to do it. Sometimes you can, you can do a light humor and still get a serious point across. I guess that's the, that's the trick you've got to learn it's a, it's a bit of a tight, tightrope walk there, you know, uh, because if you, if you make something f really funny and it's a super serious issue, you're going to get a blowback from people thinking that, what do you, what, what's so funny about this? And then there are those issues that just are not funny and you don't treat them as funny. You don't even try to, to inject humor into, into them. But uh, there, are, there are those issues that just lend themselves to Sometimes politics can be so ridiculous that <laughs> the only thing you can do is laugh at it. 
Thank you for joining us for this special edition of Global Perspectives. Our deepest sympathies and condolences go out to the Bercia family and all who were impacted by John and his work.